this so this um, um, project is called Economists in the Household: The Study of American Consumption in uh, after 1923. Um, so I'm a researcher, and I did my PhD in Lausanne at the Vargas Pareto Center. Uh, and um, this study is about this specific date, 1923, which is the publication of this book, uh, which was written by Hazan Kirk, an economist from uh, Chicago. She did her PhD uh, in 1920 at Chicago and published this book under this title. We actually got uh, a prize um, um, which we probably are not meeting with this, but there was some eminent members, eminent professors in the jury of the prize, and uh, Hazel Kirk won, won this prize uh, for this book. So I'm going to try to convince you in this presentation um, why this book is crucial for the history of economic thought, and more specifically, why the fact that um, this was a woman who wrote it, why this has some important, crucial, um, this is an important matter, and why this is interesting. So I'll tell you more about her in a moment. But for now, I'd like to give some element of, elements of context for uh, this period. So we're in the US, the early 20th century, and um, I believe we can identify three big transformations. The first one is a material transformation, which um, is basically the, the birth of consumer society. Um, the, the effective birth would be around the 30s, 50s, but the 1900s and the 20s, there are major shifts in the production um, system of the US and the way people actually consume goods. So this is the first transformation. The second one is a disciplinary one. Meaning that the, um, around 1900s, um, there was a major professionalization trend, trend of professionalization for both economics, but also several other disciplines, such as home economics. And I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by home economics, of course. Um, so this is the second transformation. The third one is the one that has to do with the role of women in society, in academia, in homes. The role of women is changing because they um, started to have less emphasis on uh, domestic tasks, um, high production, and more and more about consumption and other things that I will talk about in a moment. So my basic um, starting point for this presentation is to argue that the history of home economics intersects these three major transformations. So now, um, for the sake of giving you an outline of this presentation, I'm presenting you three questions. So of course, I'll give you some elements of definitions. Uh, about what home economics is about, uh, what's its history, and where it matters in the American history. Second question is, what does the history of the American home economics movement tell us about the history of economic ideas? I'm an historian of economics, and I'm interested in um, looking at the frontiers of the history of economics. The third question, which will be much more, which will be much more uh, narrow, um, is about Hazel Kirk. Um, and I'm asking with this: Why does Hazel Kirk's work and career matter in the history of American economics in general? So I will start here with some elements of definition. So some of you uh, may have an idea of what home economics is about. Um, some, um, some, uh, I met some American which, which would uh, tell me that it was, home ec was so, something in the US, or maybe still is, you'll tell me, Erica. But home ec 
is something something very really important and well known in America, in the US. And the problem is that these terms um, are, correspond actually to different names, home economics, domestic economy or economics, household economics. So straight away, I'm, um, I'll argue here that um, the names are changing across the, the 20th century. And the fact that it started, you can see here in this treatise on domestic economy, um, it started as domestic economy uh, or domestic science, but at some point it shifted towards um, a definition of home economics, emphasizing the idea of home um, um, and emphasizing the um, the, the disciplinary uh, and the, um, the credential of economics, make, trying to make it as a science, a social science. And this shifted a bit in the 40s, 30s, 40s um, to the term household economics, which, were, which was less um, attached to the idea of home, which was too progressive at, at the time. So we could argue, was it a domain of knowledge, uh, a field of research, a discipline, a science, a movement? So it was actually all of those, but mostly a domain of knowledge and a movement around 1900s. And um, I'll talk to you about this in a moment, but uh, in the 19th century, there was actually a long tradition of domestic advice manuals for young ladies, young uh, women, to know how to actually manage a home, how to cook. Um, this was the idea, the basic idea. And of course, um, this was um, this book from 1841 was uh, Catherine Beecher's, Beecher's uh, Treatise on Domestic Econ Economy, which was trying to make this teaching of home economics more scientific but not as scientific as it will be in um uh in a 30 years later let's say so one other thing is to ask is this home economics movement an american specificity so i'm inclined to say yes but we know that there are home economics movements and teaching uh, in Latin America, in Europe as well, in Germany. So it did exist, but uh, it did exist. But uh, in the US, home economics had a specific flavor because of um, the, the US history, because of the way um, the US developed, the way the um, the teaching, the academic, the academic system um, emerged in the 19th century. So it has a really strong um, impact on the US. So when did it start? It? So, of course, um, I know that my title of this presentation was after 1923, but I would like to take a few moments here to um, to take you back to the history of home economics, because I would like to, I would like you to understand why um, this mattered in 1923. So allow me, allow me please here to um, give you some pointers on the history of the home economics movement. So this is maybe the most um, important character of this history. Ellen Swallow Richards was a chemist originally, uh, the very uh, first woman uh, graduating from MIT. Um, she actually, because she was a woman, she was not, uh, she could not um, uh, enroll in MIT, so she managed to be, um, to enter MIT as a special student, it was some kind of an experiment of having a woman uh, at MIT, and she, she did uh, graduate, and um, she was very interesting in chemistry, sanitary sciences, nutrition, uh, she also conducted studies on water pollution, cost of living, um, 
and of course home economics later in the 1880s. So she was a progressive reformer. She was aiming at reforming the way um, people lived, and she had um, a strong faith in science to bring progress. But for that matter, home economics was perceived as the new science that could benefit the country by putting women at the center of um, progress. And of course, the places to do that was the home. Women's role in the home um, was the best way to bring progress in the US. So just to give you an idea, this was uh, the Department of Chemistry at MIT. And as you can see, maybe you can see her uh, down right. Um, Ellen Richards was the only woman, of course, uh, at this department, but she managed to um, to create a, a women's laboratory where she taught to women chemistry to empower women and to bring their um, expertise in science for progress. In the 90s, um, she created what was called the New English Kitchen or the Rampart Kitchen. Uh, this, this is a photograph from the um, Chicago's um, World Fair in 1893, where she presented um, the new research uh, and experiments about food, how we can come up with new recipes um, uh, which, which were nutritious, nutritious and um, low cost. So this is the basic background, very interested in nutrition, chemistry. And one could ask, well, what does this have to do with um, economics? Well, the shift was at this moment when, in 1899, Ellen Richards organized the Lake Placid Conferences. Um, once a year, during 10 years, she organized with a group of other women and one man, you can see here, um, and uh, it was actually the owner of the place with his woman, Annie Bini. This was John Bini, uh, the creator of the, of the Bini system, classification system. And, um, and so they organized these uh, conferences, trying to settle once and for all what home economics is about and what can it bring to the US to people, to women. And during these debates they, uh, and discussions, they um, realized that home economics was actually mirroring economics and that home economics was, uh, has actually a lot to do with consumption. This new role women has, uh, have now in the um, of consuming goods rather than producing them at home. So she also wrote on cost of living, which was a crucial, um, which was a crucial question at the time. And this is her book, Euthanics, the, the last one she published in 1910, which was intentionally, intentionally, uh, she intentionally coined the term as opposed to eugenics. Euthenics was about um, bringing change to the environment of people and not to their, um, uh, from a reproductory perspective. So the aim was to bring science in the American home. So one could ask, is home economics intrinsically conservative? Because of course, it's quite different from modern feminism as we know it. Um, but for Richards, for people like Richards at the time, Science should play a role to emancipate women. And the fact that we don't allow women to convert science was a pity because this would be this would be progress. So she emphasized uh, she emphasized um, the, um, this new role of women uh, as consumer rather than domestic producers. And to do so, she um, developed 
suggested budgets um, which could help everyone, but especially women, because they were thought to be the, the ones that were actually consuming and organizing the um, the revenues of the of, of the household. And so she developed some ways of um, helping people at knowing what they should be spending and depending on their incomes. So just a few graphs, uh, diagram, uh, what diagram she developed. And you can see this will be important for the later parts with Hazel Kirkwood. But this is the, um, on, on the left, you can see the region of choice, which is um, actually a way of saying some people have a choice in consumption because their incomes actually allows it. Um, so she understood that people have actually some means of choosing. We're not just um, taking our revenue in and taking them out for consuming, but we have a choice and we need to address this need of understanding why and how we can choose our goods. And of course, the issue of cost of living at the time was um, was um, major. Um, I'm not getting into the inflation and economic um, history matters here, but I would just like to mention here that this was one of the questions that she was aiming at um, when she wrote those books. And in the 20s, you could see in journals like the Ladies' Home Journal uh, advertising. This is the one. This is one from uh, Campbell's Soup, L C H, as in uh, Let Campbell Help. Um, and if you reverse the letters, H C L, High Cost of Living. So this was uh, this was a crucial uh, part of the context of the time in the twenties. We need some expertise on how to consume. And um, at that time, home economics were the, the people that were the, the, the best um, in position to address these issues. So now, in the 20s, some women from the Midwest and East and the Eastern part of the US, um, some of them were very interesting, interested in home economics. Some other were um, economists. They had PhDs in economics. And um, I will focus here on Hazel Kirk, which is the most famous figure of these women economists in the 20s, 30s. But the economics of consumption, which was the field that emerged from home economics at the time in the 20s, 1910s, 1920s. The economics of consumption was not um, very popular among male uh, mainstream economics at the time, we could say. And this is a quote from a famous economist in 1915 saying that in certain group of topics in which it is difficult to get beyond platitude and exhortation, um, home economics was not considered as a science from economists, and uh, but home economists wanted to bring consumption, um, wanted to uh, develop theories of consumption because they thought economists were not addressing the issue. So some historians, some historians as well, like Joseph Berthman, um characterized this economics of consumption as a special area of consumption economics, which was very close to what we know as um, the institutionalist movement. So now getting back to Hazel Kirk, now that you have some background on what home economics was about. Was about. So in this research project, my aim is first to Look at the reception and evolution of Kirk's theory. I'll explain to you what are the main um, 
elements that are in, in it. I want to map this field of economics of consumption and how it evolved in the 20s and 30s. And the third point is to use Kirk theory as a case study um, to address several issues, one of them being um, uh, some epistemological issues which were going on uh, at the time, notably, should theory be realistic or shouldn't it matter for that purpose? Um, about gender as well, what was uh, the fact that Kurt was a woman um, had an impact on this theory she produced. And of course, for the history of science, um, what I mean by that is that consumption as a subject of study is something that one could say is, of course, it's economics. Of course, it's about economics. But at the time, this was not something um, uh, evident because consumption was associated to um, women, which was less scientific. So Hazel Kirk um, did a bachelor's and PhD at Chicago. This was the original title of the dissertation, of the dissertation which led to the publication of the theory of consumption. Um, one interesting thing is that she wanted to be um, a professor of economics. She had a PhD in economics, but she was appointed to the home economics department, which was where uh, women economists were. And um, but she obtained uh, a position at the economics department in 29 and got a full position professorship uh, in 41, still at Chicago. But one thing that will be important for the, the latest part of this presentation is that although she started with a th very theoretical inquiry, she ended up in the 30s and 50s studying um, mostly empirical and statistical uh, study, mostly at the Bureau of Home Economics from the Federal U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, the Office of Price Administration, of course, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So just to give you an idea, but um, very briefly, uh, this is a selected um, uh, selection of uh, Hazel Cook's work. Uh, bolded are the books, and she published a uh, lot more than this, but you can get a general idea of what she was interested about, about rational consumption, the consumer, the field of consumption. She published in both uh, home economics journal, but also marketing, um, and of course, American Economic uh, Reviews. And um, so, so she started from a very theoretical standpoint. But at some point, she started to um, get more interested in, in uh, empirical work. I'll go back to this in a moment. But first of all, I'd like to give some context on, um, on women's employment in academia at the time. So, of course, um, before the, the 20th century, um, forehead university were, were very scarce. 30% of them were co-educational in 1870s and 70% in 1900. So of course, um, even though they had PhDs, especially after um, 1910s, the 1910s, uh, it was difficult for women to get position, positions in economics. And as I believe you understood now, home economics um, was a disciplinary refuge for women trained as economic as economists. So um, for Kirk, this is the quote I put here: "When I, an economist by training with all my teaching in economics, was asked to join a department of home economics to give work in economics, I assumed that it was in economics, as the economists used the term." I am not competent to give anything else. So you can see, you, you could see that she was aiming at being an economist, but um, the institution, the institutions where she wanted to uh, to be, um, only wanted men at that time. Some general, some letters I found um, 
with her mentor and uh, PhD advisor. It's um, he said to her when she was asking if um, he had a he, he had a job for her. It's a funny job market this year. There has really been a very heavy demand for men, but at rather low salaries and practically nothing for women. The year after that, I have mentioned your name in two or three cases where they said they wanted a man, but nothing definite has happened yet. Has happened yet. So, in comparison with home economists um, from the 19th century, Kirk really wanted to make um, to, to develop uh, to develop a new approach of the household. She wanted to do economics. She wanted to convert economic approach to the household and not just uh, teaching women how to do uh, cooking and um, organizing, administrating their home. So she went on, nor should the title economic problems of the family be construed as home economics in the broad sense covering technical and practical questions of nutrition, child care, care of the house and selection of clothing, furniture and household equipment. The problems dealt with are, are economic and the problem but not are economic in the academic sense of that term. So she wanted to position herself um, as an economist. So now, what's really about this theory of consumption? Of course, like I've been talking about from the beginning, I haven't said anything about it yet. So for those of you who have um, a general idea of what economics is about, she was actually aiming at uh, criticizing the more general utility school, um, which from that stems, stemmed the neoclassical school of economic theory. Uh, she was close to what we call the, the old institutional economists, um, the most famous one was uh, Veblen, and she was also very much influenced by Simon Patton. So the main thing I'd like to emphasize here is that while the marginalists were aiming at studying consumption as part of a demand, the of the demand theory, um, which was mostly just an abstraction of how market functioned, uh, Cook wanted to know how people actually consumed, why exactly um, they consume what they consume, why, why they made the, these such decisions, and she wanted to investigate the, the, um, what was at stake when people took the, these decisions. So she had what she called a realistic approach to the consumer's choice. And of course, at the time, it was very popular the new psychology. Um, and of course, she also was very influenced by sociology, uh, the instinct theory, which was also um, of interest to Veblen, and habits, of course, which was interest, uh, an interest for uh, institutionalist economists as well. So the very general idea uh, is to say that she aimed at describing how people consume and advocate consumer protection, education, and uh, um, um, the autonomy of, of consumer's choice. So to understand this, this, we need both the context of the emergence of consumer society, but also um, the fact that the, the um, regulative background of the US um, was still in its infancy, although it was already started from the 1900s, but it's in that context, and also in the context of um, women employment, women economists employment. So this is the alternative she, she proposed for that. So, as I said, she wanted to, um, to develop a, a realistic approach to consumer choice. She said, men do not act, it is said, in the way the more general theorists describe them as acting. We cannot recognize ourselves or our fellows in the hedonistic, individualistic calculators 
whom they described not finding their account, any trace of the complexity of motives, impulses, and interests which lie behind market activities. So the idea is really about um, getting a, a more realistic picture of how people actually consume and not just um, arguing that, well, they are always um, aiming at their best interests because if they choose to do so, well, this must be, they, they are sovereign and they should just, we should just listen to the consumers. She said, no, we need to identify to pinpoint the different motives and impulses that are uh, at play in consumers' decision. And for that, also some elements of, of intellectual context, but she said, further, many current problems prominent in public interest are consumers' problem. problem. Chief among them is the high cost of living, truly a consumers' problem. So you can see, even in the 20s, this was still the questions, uh, the, the question of the high cost of living, which was um, the crucial one, which has been um, a crucial part of the home economics movement, uh, 20 years um, uh, before, and now it's still one of the big, biggest issues that needs to be addressed. And the second quote she relied on, um, uh, Ellen Richards, I presented you, to you earlier, saying, Mrs. Richards says, for example, the home has ceased to be the growing center of production from which radiate all desirable goods and has become but a pool towards which um, products made in other places flow, a place of consumption, not of productions of production. So here she wants to emphasize the fact that women now are consuming and not anymore um, uh, producing domestic goods at home. Although we could say that probably this has been this trend from domestic production to consumption has been less radical than what Richard Richards um, argued, but in the 20s, um, markets became one of the markets became a place where we could find goods and not uh, harm anymore. So because she went on saying the consumer then must be studied. Here is a virgin found never properly charted and explored, not only for purposes of value theory is there need of exploring the world behind the demand curve. The cry is that the consumer is weak while others are strong, that he is defrauded and exploited by monopolists, by profiteer, by speculator, by middleman. Clearly, there is a need for an examination of the position of the consumer, of the sources of his weakness, and the extent of his strength. Um, so you could see here that she was, at the same time, criticizing, criticizing the fact that uh, neoclassical economics, economics was um, not realistic, but she was also arguing um, that the consumer needs protection and that um, we need to establish um, a proper uh, depiction of the different powers of consumer produ producers um, government as well, how can we help consumers to um, consume effectively and not get ripped off by uh, producers? So just some elements on the, spe the specificity, specificity of her approach. She considered goods as bundles of utilities. When you consume one good, um, you actually consume it for, for different reasons. Uh, it could be for your just some uh, basic utilitarian theory that uh, you want this one because, for example, it's a car and that you want to go from point A to point B. This is some utility to you. But we, can, we could also say that um, there's another mode of utility uh, stemming, for example, from uh, Dublin's conspicuous consumption. Um, well, you could buy a car because uh, it's a nice way of showing some wealth to others around. Um, so it, it's not new of saying that, but this uh, was, um, she was very much influenced by uh, Torstein uh, Veblen, 
of this matter, but um, she advocated this bundle of utilities uh, way of depicting on how consume, consume uh, occurred. And um, one of the specificities that she relied on is the, the idea of standards of production of consumption. In order to understand how people actually consume, we need to understand um, how standards of consumption are um, reflecting in people's mind and how they evolve in um, society. Uh, and a high standard, this is something Miriam Bankowski uh, uh, showed, uh, high standards for Castle Kirk is, um, um, includes new goods and individualized, individualized goods. Goods. So it's not just about um, consuming high price goods or uh, goods that are um, that correspond to your preferences, but it's new goods and individualized goods. So you can see here how this would eventually connect to marketing thought at some point. And this is not um, a surprise because he influenced a lot, Hazel Kirk. Um, marketing thought in the 30s and 40s. And in, in Kirk's mind, um, this would um, become and the idea is to promote rational and wise consumption. So this means that she had a normative agenda, not only about, it was not only about um, giving a, a great and realistic depiction of consumption, but she wanted to educate and uh, make people's consumption rational. The three main um, elements were to provide information to people, um, to make them conscious, aware of how marketing actually um, proceed in this matter, and to promote autonomy of choice, of course. So Kirk was the most uh, important contributor to the economics of consumption in the 20s. And as I mentioned it earlier, um, she had huge impact on uh, marketing thought um, and also other colleagues of her that, um, um, that were instrumental in the US at Columbia, at Chicago, um, to develop uh, marketing theory. Maybe you heard about the new home economics um, of Gary Becker and Jacob Minson in the 60s, which was trying to um, um, bring, to make the home, make household, the household a new element to be um, explored by the economics discipline. This was quite different from home economics, but um, we relied on works heritage. And this is where we'll talk to you about in a moment now. This is the last part of the empirical work she conducted, which led to the, um, the consumer price surveys, which is crucial today to understand how prices evolved in the US. So now, this was her theoretical work in the 20s. But after the 30s, she mostly did empirical and statistical work, both in um, government offices, but also in books and essays. So I'm asking, how should we account for such a method a methodological shift? Well, the first answer could be, this was just a matter in personal taste, um, to change to mind. We could, um, we could, ask ourselves whether it was about the context of women employment and difficulties to obtain positions in the econ economics department. We could also um, ask whether it was about the a theoretical issue, about the instability or decline of the institutionalist framework, which was still struggling to um, base itself on the solid psycho psychological theory. I'm not getting too much into detail here because I, I'm not sure everyone knows about it, but um, 
after she retired in the 50s at Chicago, um, Margaret, which was one of her PhD students, she replaced her. And um, maybe some of you know that Chicago was a high place, was a hotspot at the time uh, for um, neoclassical economics. And, um, and uh, Margaret Reed was at some point in line with the mainstream and mainstreamization of economics at the time. So this theoretical perspective of Kirk faded away. So what I'm trying to do here, so this was a very long background, but I wanted to give you some amount of, of context um, why these questions uh, mattered, why this date of 1923 is important to um, understand how consumption was studied in the US from both economics and non-economists. Well, in the 20s and 30s after Kirk's theory, we could find home economists in different um, places. In academia, of course, in the Department of Home Economics, but also as teachers in, um, in high school, in um, uh, land-grant universities. But the second point is uh, we could find the, these home economists in government offices, like the US Department of, uh, of Agriculture, where was the, the Bureau of Home Economics, uh, the Office of Price Administration. Home economists were very important to World War II at the time. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where they conducted um, um, studies on cost of living and prices. And the third place, is, place where we could find them was uh, in private companies, especially in food industry uh, and domestic goods appliances for kitchen, but also in general, generally. So in the 20s and 30s, there was, um, there was very different, different kind of home economists. Some of them were scientists, social reformers, um, consumers, uh, consumer advocates, or marketing experts. So what I try to do here is to map the different places where Bauer um, worked, how they relied or not on Kirk's theory, and one of the case. One of the cases I'm studying now is um, in the food industry, where um, people like Mary Danker here, working for the Kraft uh, Cheese Food Company. Um, and Mary Danker is a very interesting example of um, a woman who was employed by a private company, a big company producing cheese, and they, um, they gave her some cheese and said, okay, uh, if you can come up with some ideas of recipe of how we can sell these to people. Um, and this was part of the home economist's job at the time. So of course, um, if you remember from the beginning of my presentation, of my presentation, um, the first, first generation home economists or were interested in bringing um, bringing um, progress, uh, educating women, educating women, um, bringing science in homes. This was the idea. But in the twenties, there was an ambiguity, some tensions uh, between home economists. There were some debates as well, which I'm standing to, um, between more lefty radical home economists and more conservatives one. And the, uh, the debate was about what should be the role of home economists in this context of um, the changing and evolving nature of consumer society, the changing and evolving nature of women's place in society. So there were different answers to that role of home economists. Well, it could be to defend or advocate consumers' interests um, um, because producers were um, 
trying marketing techniques were trying to rip uh, to rip consumers from their money. The second point uh, is more connected to the consumers to consumer society. They, they were trying to shape values, the values of uh, this modern American society and consumerist modernity. And the third point um, I could ask is whether they were trying to help producers who understand demand. This was um, this was essentially what Miss Christine Frederick did in her book Selling Mrs. Consumer. She was actually um, a marketing expert uh, in companies for companies. She was a consultant um, trying to help producers understand the women consumer and um, without taking into account um, the idea of protecting consumers, which which was which was a difficult tension to maintain. So the debate at the time was: should we should we embrace this modern consumerism? So this is basically what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to look at uh, to compare different different people, different women from different backgrounds in different places at university in private companies. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm also uh, trying to contrast Christian Frederick with Hazel Kirk. Um, Christian Frederick was an uh, early advocate of um, domestic terrorism. Uh, she was very interesting, interested in bringing um, management, new techniques of management into the home in order to better organize um, our homes. So this is what I'm trying to do. This is the end of the presentation. Um, I'll, now conclude, I'll now conclude. And so from the beginning of the presentation, I started um, with some elements of um, the early history of home economics. I hope that now you're convinced that uh, home economics was uh, a disciplinary refuge for women tra trained as um, economists um, in the, between the 19 and the 1900s and uh, the 30s or even 40s. Hazel Kirk was um, is an interesting case study I use in this research uh, to illustrate the three transformations I mentioned to you earlier. Um, the material, which meaning the emergence, the emergence of consumer society, a disciplinary transformation, um, which has to do with the, how economics, home economics, the different disciplines, sociology, uh, political sciences, how they emerged and how they tried to become um, science and um, credible science. And third transformation, the role of women in society, in academia as well, in the homes, um, and my point was to argue that uh, the history of home economics and the specificity of uh, Kirk's work and career are emblematic of these three, three transformations that can inform us on the history of economics and on the history of American sciences in general. So Kirk has had two main influences, home economics, and institutional economics, Veblen specifically, which was harsh critique of neoclassical standard economics. What she wanted to do was to develop um, a realistic account of consumption, a realistic theory. This is the positive, uh, the positive um, strand of uh, her work. And at the same time, she advocated uh, consumer education, which was much more normative, uh, which was um, Different than what neoclassical was uh, were um, were trying to do at the time. Science meant ob objective reasoning and not advocating at uh, or educating people. So this was a quite different perspective from the economic standpoint. But at the end of the twenties, she moved away from theory, and this moving away of Kirk from theory. From theory is for me a starting point 
of how the field um, exploded and became a new map of different people uh, doing different things in the context of the, this new consumerist, consumerist modernity. So what I'm trying to do here is to, to map Kirk Fury reception and how this reception evolved and how her theory evolved um, without Ruth and without her. So I want to delineate the changing frontier and um, and reconfigurations of home economics in the 20, in the 30s. Home economics had changed. Um, economic economic theory had changed, also changed, and the frontier of what was thought as economics um, was was questioned at that time. And consumption, st the study of consumption was. Uh, a very interesting case it is a very interesting interesting case to account for um, the changing frontier of interdisciplinarity. Um, so yeah, this is uh, essentially what I just said. But um, this is how studying Kirk and the reception and evolution of her theory helps me to understand. I want to understand how. What makes a science, a discipline, a discipline? Is it the subjects? Is it the people that are studying it? Um, how the fact that uh, she was a woman uh, made a difference uh, in this history? And, um, and also the fact that consumption was a, was a challenged sub subject, which was not necessarily to be studied um, from the perspective of economics, and the idea that some women home economists at the frontier of economics did study it, it's an interesting case, um, which I am doing it now. And finally, in uh, less than a month or more than a month or so, in this very room, um, I'm planning to organize a workshop. I'll, I'll organize a workshop. Um, because maybe you noticed it, but we, you know, we, today we're in uh, 2023. It will be 100 years after Kirk's theory publication. And um, we will be having some papers and presenters from all around the world um, to talk about Kirk specifically um, uh, in very different perspective. And um, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, if you would like to join either online or in person, you will. You are most than most than welcome. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring and fascinating talk. I especially say we have first discovered the new world for the majority of folks. I guess the whole economics and you know, half the economics. So questions or comments. Yes. Uh, hey. <laughs> wow, I know so much. Is this on? I can't tell. Um, so you had asked about the U.S. sort of situation. So I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit dated, but back in eighth grade in the Vermont public school system, everyone had to take home ec. Um, I believe still in public high schools around the country, there still may be home economic requirements referred to as home ec. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting because, uh, you know, I remember from that class, like we had to learn how to cook a few things. We talked about nutrition. I think we had to learn to operate a sewing machine. It was males and females. I think we had to learn to change a diaper. Um, so very much sort of what would go on in the home from an activity application standpoint and budgeting. I remember also we spent a couple of weeks learning how to budget if you needed to buy this, that, and the other thing. And what, but anyway, very, very interesting. So one of the ways you had asked a question about sort of the reception of her theory and also maybe to some extent application, and perhaps this has already been done, but I think it would be so interesting to see how 
the home economics curriculum in the United States uh, was introduced and evolved. And if you can see any connections between 